The title of this presentation is Focusing for Bigger Picture Decision Making. I need you to promise me, which pinky, that you will engage this conversation because I'm talking to you. I promise. I'm speaking, I'm communicating with you, and I need you to be the type of leader that will take this message and share this message with people who are very important to you. So this is why I need us to be 100% engaged. Can I get your promise? Yes. Absolutely, thank you. So the main goal of this keynote address is to encourage everyone to focus for a bigger picture decision making. To make this happen, I need to unravel and deconstruct three very important concepts. First, the bigger picture. Second, pride. And last, community consequences. So I'm gonna need you to say these three terms with me just to make sure that I've got your promise. The first is the bigger picture. The second is and the last is community consequences. All right, so we're ready to go. The bigger picture. When my daughter, Sydney, was eight years old, she took a macro photo of the inside of a tulip. A macro photo showcases a subject larger than it is in real life with an extreme close-up of something that is so, so small. To this day, it is one of the most beautiful and mysterious images that I have ever seen. One, because the photo was taken by someone who was inquisitive, kind-hearted, and ready to observe and learn. But second, and this is why you're here with this, is because when we focus away from the view that is most common to everyone, then the new version of the picture can be interpreted as, interpreted as something new, but also something that is appealing in an all-encompassing all -encompassing way that photo will depict what I refer to today as the bigger picture. So the bigger picture is a more kind and focused view of any perspective that allows one to see what they might commonly ignore or what has gone unnoticed. And the bigger picture, it makes those details so much more clear. And I wanna encourage everyone to work on moving away from only seeing their broader view of the tulip. I want you to instead be able to focus in on specific details that might even distort the original view of your tulip image. So moving in and moving out, moving in and out of these views, this is the part of a process of developing an intercultural focus. And with this concept of the bigger picture, I suggest that we practice refocusing the context. The context. We refocus the context by engaging a view that is actually more macro. And this view may even change your outlook on life. So as well, this bigger picture, everybody say bigger picture. Bigger picture. It allows us to think in a way that encompasses our ability to refocus our lenses beyond our own individual monocultural focus. So look beyond your own focus. You think you can do that? Yes. Okay, I'm not sure. You think you can do that? Yes. Okay, we'll see. So next. The concept that I will communicate with you about now is pride. So pride, pride plays a unique role in the significance of this bigger picture. Pride is an emotive effect, or rather a passion. The passion of pride leaves an imprint both in your mind and on your heart. Pride is the mental force of excessively high opinions. These prideful opinions ultimately distinguish how valuable or how important something may be to you. So thus, I'm going to say today that pride is also directly intertwined with a person's emotional intelligence. Can you say emotional intelligence? I-E-E-Q. E-Q is your emotional intelligence. 
This is your awareness or control and handling of expressions of your opinion. So this may ultimately affect how patient you are, how mindful you are, and your related mental health outcomes for the people who are involved in conversations with you. Can everybody say again, emotional intelligence? I.E. EQ. EQ is your emotional intelligence. So I want to encourage this group to not only consider more closely what you choose to take pride in, but also think critically about how you respond to things that you do not take pride in. So here I'm going to introduce to you IQ, EQ, and CQ. So we're going to say these together. Say IQ, IQ. EQ, EQ, and CQ. CQ. This is your intellectual intelligence, right? IQ is the intellectual intelligence that is commonly known as intelligence of your brain. EQ is your emotional intelligence, and that's intelligence through your personality. Now CQ is cultural intelligence. Raise your hand if you ever heard of CQ before. Mm -hmm. Cultural intelligence. So this is a collective intelligence that is developed through holistic understandings of different communities and cultures. So I would like you to consider expanding your definition of pride to establish a more unique combination of these three unique forms of intelligence. But understand, please, that each form of intelligence is developed differently. I'll say that again, just in case you didn't hear me, because I feel like I'm getting into this a little bit. Each form of intelligence is developed differently, uniquely, distinctly, and intentionally. Intentionally. So this process of exploring your pride tactics and your views of bigger pictures involves reassessing and refocusing your de decision-making processes and your related responsible behaviors. Your behaviors, that's how you act, how you engage people. So let me talk to you about how we engage these three intelligence forms, right? IQ is learned through knowledge retention. So you have to access information. You have to get information and you have to make an effort to memorize, that means to know and to communicate this information, but you have to use a learning method that works for you because everyone in here learns differently. Do you all understand that? Everybody learns differently. But when you engage your IQ, you are bringing in information. You're taking in information. That means it's something that you know. But EQ is very different from IQ. EQ is that emotional intelligence. And EQ is learned through practice. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> EQ is learned by practicing emotional intelligence. It's not learned by just knowledge retention. EQ, you have to emphasize this, that it's not learned through inter information gathering only. So if you think you can go to a friend and just tell them a bunch of stuff, don't think that empathy will directly come from that knowledge that they've gained. So through experience, we learn how to use emotional intelligence to respond to different situations and views. And we also craft or determine an understanding through social learning. Now, sociologists refer to EQ, or this emotional learning process, as the development of taste. Can you say taste the way I say it? Taste. taste. Yeah. Well, guess what I call it? I call it the reinforcement of your use of the lemon face. Got to be in my class for that. How you might stare at something with disgust as if you have just tasted the most sour lemon in existence. These lemon faces are often mimicked and mocked by individuals who you allow to carry your mattress. So those who carry your mattress are people who you trust to carry you when you are unable to carry yourself. You see what's happening now. So these people who help you to carry yourself, they also determine your EQ. Do you all hear what I'm saying? I'm telling you that you do not develop your EQ alone. 
EQ is impressionable. That means that the change of EQ is what we call constant and non-homogenous. That means that change happens all the time. It is constant and it is impacted by your social, emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual connections. So that change of your EQ is non-homogenous and that means that it is, it does, um, it does not change for the same reasons or at the same time as everybody else's EQ. So now that you understand that IQ, that intellectual intelligence, right? And then the EQ, that's your emotional intelligence. Now I'm gonna describe to you CQ, okay? And I know this is a lot of Qs, EQ, IQ, CQ, a lot of IQs and CQs and EQ, I get it, right? But I think you understand. Can you raise your pinky if you understand? I think you're with me, right? So now, CQ is cultural intelligence, and I'm going somewhere with this, I promise you. This is learned through respectful engagement. This requires work with both your IQ and your EQ, okay? Because it's an intelligence that is developed over time. So you cannot develop CQ by hanging out with your black friend that you just met yesterday, or your Asian friend that you just met yesterday, or your friend, your one friend that you talk to about stuff. I got that out. So I may be stretching, just a little bit, by asking you to absorb and enhance the meanings and development processes of these three forms of intelligence, especially if you're one of my friends who feel like you feel the lemon face coming on. So think for a second. Can you imagine what you felt like? the last time another human being looked at you as if they had just sucked a lemon. Imagine what it would be like if we could decrease the negative energy that is transferred through these looks. I also need you to understand that if you're willing to take on this mental journey that I'm about to take you on right now, that you might have to explore focusing for a bigger picture in a way that you reconsider and consider again whether your character and your values align with a more focused, bigger picture view. Are you able and willing to develop an intercultural mindset or is it just all about you and what you think is important? That's tough, that's a tough question. Somebody's volume just turned off, but turn it back on. Because in some cases, we may need to re-examine how likely it is that our everyday behaviors using this IQ, EQ, and CQ, whether they actually produce responsible decisions. Because some of you are super irresponsible. Because you are basing your decisions on your monocultural perspective and you are not looking closely enough to understand how your decisions impact more cultures and communities. Because right now, sometimes when you want something to happen, it is about you and your family and the people who carry your mattress. You may need to re-examine how everyday decisions produce consequences that are more harmful to others than they are to you. And that those individuals whom you support and the individuals who you depend on may really need you to think outside of the box in more ways than you had before. And anyway, we need to explore our pride development because I said so, because I said it's a healthy process, because you trust me a little bit. Next. Community consequences. I'm gonna scaffold a little bit. So when I'm teaching sociology, I do something called scaffolding. That's this process where I try to reconnect the previous points and then I bring them together to highlight what I think is important for the larger idea. So let me pull it back a little bit and make sure that we understand everything because you're trusting me right now to give you a story. So to understand community consequences, we need to circle back to the micro and the macro concepts. So let me dig a little bit into that. So understanding the big picture, right? It's mostly about reframing and understanding the context, right? That's that tulip picture. 
or the micro picture, the tiny picture, right? And so more specifically, I'm gonna say that there are circumstances that help us to determine this lens that we're using to see something. And so for some of us, our lenses are tinted tan, or they might be a hue of blue if you have a certain swag like Jamila. Some lenses have a prescription tint because an individual may need to protect their eyes, but they also need additional support to see clearly. But the point is that we all have a journey that has shaded pictures that allow our lenses to see things in a certain way. Some people have called this the tools that you carry in your toolbox. There are lots of different ways that we frame this. But each circumstance, right, each of us allows us to look at the same picture. So everybody here is looking at me, and you're in this room, and you're looking at the same thing. However, your lens in the context will help you see and hear and feel the same situation differently. It's because we are all actually different. And we engage, right, pride using our IQ, EQ, and CQ in our own very unique ways. Are you with me? Snap your finger if you're with me. All right. Most of all, those intelligent strategies encourage us to take pride in different things. I suspect that our lenses characterize the context and that our pride processes allow us to focus our lenses. And this is why pride is so important for this story. Does everybody understand that? So our context has a multitude of conditions and these conditions are shaped in ways and many angles. And I'm gonna tell you and I promise you that we have so very many shady lenses that we deal with with people on a regular basis. Shady lenses. You're not gonna forget that. So the lenses around us allow us to form narratives and those narratives shape our discourse and for discourse sake, I'm gonna say that's how you talk to people with your money. And these establish the accepted and unaccepted versions of information. How you talk to people with your money impacts your pride point. And it also impacts, right, how you understand information. Tell me I'm a lie. You can't, you can't do it. So here, I make the claim that until we increase our CQ or our cultural intelligence, we may never fully understand or be able to assess how to treat society equitably. So let me be more specific here even more. So I know some of us need me to peel this back, so here it comes, and I said this. Some of us operate with a monocultural mindset. When we see things from our own monocultural perspective, not only are we unfamiliar with cultures, but we are also unlikely to have interest in cultures and values of individuals who are not like us. In lieu of this, we may avoid interaction with other cultures, especially those who are drastically different. The monocultural fo uh, focus is very micro level. It's a micro lens, and in fact, it's the exact opposite of the macro lens in the photo taken by my daughter seven years ago. This micro lens, it is actually this picture that we, where we allow ourselves to reject images because we view these things radically different and we view them as being ugly. We view them as uh, versions of our pictures that are like snags or tears or defects or unneeded background details that should be blurred. We even see these new enhancements in our cell phone cameras. Our cell phone cameras help us spotlight something and blur the background details. So even, in de even in te with technology, we're pretending. The other perspective is so far away, it's so blurry, it's so not visual, that we make it invisible sometimes or we make it seem more negative than it really is. And we often see these blurry views as the opposite of right. So what is blurry is the opposite of right. And we think we see the view clearly, but what we really see is our own monocultural ideas and depictions that we create of what is potentially an inverse of our own view. So everything that is not you is ugly, or it shouldn't be in the picture. Therefore, you make it invisible. Because we have not decided or learned to focus enough to see how all of these perspectives are interconnected into one image. And we oftentimes black out anything that doesn't fit into our view or we perceive those as distractions to our processes or our missions. Because that multicultural context that multicultural context 
can also make us less aware of deeper patterns of the bigger picture. And moreover, it keeps us small. When we view things only as that tulip, it keeps us really small. And let me repeat that again. My monocultural perspectives can keep us small if we avoid meaningful interactions with other parts of the picture. So some of us, especially our leaders, socialize our peers to see only our pictures, only the tulip. And we are more likely to be like, or to like, or to love those, to love a little bit harder, those elements that we are socialized to take pride in. So understanding the bigger context is important for helping to consider specific deliverables, like what we should aim for, or how we decide, or what we expect, or who we decide to respect. And so a skill that I would like everybody to gain from this conversation is called consequence-based thinking. So I need everyone to say consequence-based thinking. So peeling back this idea, I'm suggesting that we need to think about greater community consequences as we explore the world through this bigger picture lens. So by enhancing our pride mission, so this is looking at a broader scope, we can improve our character values and we can adapt to new responsible behavior because this tactic for enhancing pride, it involves ethics and principles for civic responsibility. Now in my sociology class, I teach and I encourage students to participate in what we call experiential learning. And that's like a service activity where there's like homework and then there's readings that you have to do. Because this process, during this process, the students are trained to increase their commitment to higher order thinking skills. And so these skills broaden their CQ lenses beyond the micro lens. So this process involves deepening an understanding and awareness of individuals, communities, and themselves. So the point here is that we need to reshade our lenses time, in time and over time to expand the depth of our views. So through consequence-based thinking, we're going to process and focus in on the reality where you allow your lens to interconnect with the perspectives of other groups and other populations. And so this is how this works. Everybody say teamwork makes the dream work. So when we zoom in or focus our understandings on the details of the other cultures, and our cultures, right? We better understand how our passions and our prideful decisions impact other groups. And so this awareness does not translate into empathy every time. Because IQ is just information that we know. And so this is the reason why we have so many well-meaning friends who believe they see what's happening, but they have no idea what to do because they have IQ, they don't have EQ, and they don't have CQ that relates to that picture that we need people to see, that macro level picture. So this is our challenge that we have. And so pride moves beyond the monocultural mono perspective or the knowledge base level. This might take us to reevaluate our decisions when we feel the ways that additional consequences can affect people and we see and we feel how harmful those consequences are. So consequence-based thinking is the type of thinking that makes us consider whether our IQ and EQ choices that we believe are morally right are actually the right thing to do. And what I mean by that is sometimes you believe something is morally right for yourself and for the people who carry your mattresses and for the people who are following you, but it may not be the right thing to do right now. Why is it not the right thing to do? Because the consequences are not positive and the negative effects for others cannot be mitigated. So sometimes if you think it's right, it's not right and you're not using your IQ, your EQ, and your CQ together to understand that something that's so big for you is so little for the world. And so some people wanna win so much that their winning hurts other individuals. So I'm here to tell you that you can actually maximize your winning by creating a non-hostile environment and a platform that allows the people around you to win and in this case, the scope of your winning is different, but it's still a grand win. Because when we teach individuals to practice using their emotional intelligence, 
We can help our winners to make decisions that are more likely to positive, positively impact all humankind and society as a whole.